Hi, Rachel here with the Charlotte Mason Plenary. We're so glad you found the audiobook of Volume 6, Charlotte's Last Volume, A Philosophy of Education. It is by far, in my opinion, the best and most transformative volume, so you're definitely in the right place. Now, we at a Charlotte Mason Plenary are offering this audio to you perfectly free because we think everybody should be reading Charlotte's words. However, we do offer an annotated edition in both print and in the audiobook version. So, the best of both worlds, in my opinion, is the audiobook, whether it has annotations or not, and the annotated editions. Because in the annotated editions, you get all of these wonderful side notes in the margins that explain what Charlotte's talking about, as well as give you definitions and stuff to all that uh, Victorian English. So, best of both worlds, audiobook and annotated edition. Please visit us over at a Charlotte Mason Plenary at cmplenary.com, and I hope you enjoy the audiobook. Section 3a The Knowledge of the Universe, Science. Huxley's axiom that science teaching in the school should be of the nature of common information is of use in defining our limitations in regard to the teaching of science. We find another limitation in the fact that children's minds are not in need of the mental gymnastics that such teaching is supposed to afford. They are entirely alert and eager to know. Books dealing with science, as with history, say, should be of a literary character, and we should probably be more scientific as a people if we scrapped all the textbooks which swell publishers' lists and nearly all the chalk expended so freely on our blackboards. The French mind has appreciated the fact that the approach to science as to other subjects should be more or less literary, that the principles which underlie science are at the same time so simple, so profound, and so far-reaching that the due setting forth of these provokes what is almost an emotional response. These principles are therefore meet subjects for literary treatment, while the details of their application are so technical and so minute as, except by way of illustration, to be unnecessary for schoolwork or for general knowledge. We have not a copia scientific literature in English, but we have quite enough to go on with in our schools. We find an American publication called The Sciences, whose author would seem to be an able man of literary power, of very great value in linking universal principles with common incidences of everyday life, in such a way that interest never palls. And any child may learn on what principles an electric bell works, what sound means, how a steam engine works, and many other matters explained here with great lucidity. Capital diagrams and descriptions make experiments easy, and children arrive at their first notions of science without the verbiage that darkens counsel. Form 2A read Life and Her Children by Arabella Buckley and get a surprising knowledge of the earlier and lower forms of life. 2B take pleasure in Kingsley's Madam How and Lady Why. They are expected to do a great deal of out-of-door work in which they are assisted by the changing year admirable month-by-month -month studies of what is to be seen out of doors. They keep records and drawings in a nature notebook and make special studies of their own for the particular season with drawings and notes. The studies of Form 3 for one term enable children to make a rough sketch of a section of ditch or hedge or seashore and put in the names of the plants you would expect to find. Write notes with drawings of the special study you have made this term. What do you understand by calyx, corolla, stamen, pistil? In what ways are flowers fertilized? How would you find the pole star? Mention six other stars and say in what constellations they occur. How would you distinguish between early, decorated, and perpendicular Gothic? Give drawings. Questions like these, it will be seen, cover a good deal of field work and the study of some half-dozen carefully selected books on natural history, botany, architecture, and astronomy, the principle being that children shall observe and chronicle, but shall not depend upon their own unassisted observation. The study of natural history and botany with bird lists and plant lists continues throughout school life, 
while other branches of science are taken term by term. The questions for Form 4 for one term illustrate the various studies of the scholars in natural history, general science, hygiene, and physiology. In fact, their studies are so various that it is difficult to give each a separate title in the program. Geography. Question 1. Write a short sketch of Central Asia with map. 2. Compare Palestine with the Yorkshire Moors. Describe the Valley of the Jordan. 3. There is but one Nelson. Illustrate by half a dozen instances. 4. What is said in Ethan of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? Natural History 1. What do you know of A. The Manatee B. The Whalebone Whale Sketch of Skeleton C. Porpoises and Dolphins or Describe A. Quartz Crystals B. Felspar C. Mica D. Hornblende In what rock do these occur? 2. What do you know of insectivorous plants? Name those you know. 3. What circumstances strike you in a walk in summer? General Science 1. What do you understand by A. Electrical Attraction B. Repulsion C. Conductors D. Insulators E. Methods of Obtaining Electricity 2. Prove that you never see matter itself and show how sight gives us knowledge. Physiology 1. Describe the structure of the human ear. Perhaps Some Wonders of Matter by Bishop Mercer is the most inspiring of the half-dozen volumes in current use in Form 4 for this section of their work. The questions indicate the varied nature of the work, and the answers show that in every case the knowledge is fairly wide and thorough. All the children in the school are usually ready to answer each question on the work of the term. Forms 5 and 6 again cover a wide field, as the following questions on a term's work sufficiently indicate. Geography. Form 6, Question 1. Show how the discovery of the New World affected England in commerce and war. 2. According to what general law is life distributed on the earth? 3. Describe the siege of Mexico by Cortez and its surrender. Form 6 and 5, Question 4. How has the war affected A. Luxembourg, B. The eastern frontier of Belgium, C. Antwerp and the Scheldt? Form 5, Question 1. Show how the restoration affected our American possessions. 2. Show accurately how longitude is determined. 3. Sketch the history and character of Montezuma. Geology and General Science. Form 6, Question 1. Discuss fully A. The cause of radioactivity and B. Gravitation. 2. What have you to say of the scenic aspects of the English treatise? Name a dozen of the fossils. Sketch half a dozen. Form 5, Question 1. Give as full an explanation as you can of color. 2. Describe the composition of the igneous rocks. Where do they appear? Biology, botany, etc. Form 6, Question 1. What are the characters of the backboneless animals? Describe half a dozen examples. 2. Describe an account for the vegetation of A. Woodlands, B. Heath, C. Moorland, D. Meadow. Form 5, Question 1. How would you classify the industries of animals? Give examples. Question 2. Describe the flora of the seashore. Form 6 and 5, Question 3. Describe with drawings the special study you have made this term. Astronomy. Form 6. What do you understand by precession? Describe the precession and mutation of the Earth's axis. 5. Write an essay on the planet Mercury. If we wanted an excuse for affording children a wide syllabus, introducing them at any rate to those branches of science of which every normal person should have some knowledge, we find it in the deprecatory words of Sir Richard Gregory in his presidential address in the Education Science section of the British Association. He said that education might be defined as a deliberate adjustment of a growing human being to its environment, and the scope and character of the subjects of instruction should be determined by this biological principle. What was best for one race or epoch need not be best for another. The essential mission of school science was to prepare pupils for civilized citizenship by revealing to them something of the beauty and the power of the world in which they lived.
as well as introducing them to the methods by which the boundaries of natural knowledge had been extended. School science, therefore, was not intended to prepare for vocations, but to equip pupils for life. It should be part of a general education, unspecialized, but in no direct connection with possible university courses to follow. Less than 3% of the pupils from state-aided secondary schools proceeded to universities, and yet most of the science courses in these schools were based on syllabuses of the type of university entrance examinations. The need of the many were sacrificed to the few. Too much importance was attached to what could be covered by personal experiment and observation, every science examination qualifying for the first school certificate, which now represented subjects normally studied up to about 16 years of age, was mainly a test of practical acquaintance with facts and principles encountered in particular limited fields, but not a single one afforded recognition of a broad and ample course of instruction in science such as was a necessary complement to laboratory work. The numbers of examination candidates suggested that general scientific teaching was almost non-existent. The range of instruction in the portions of subjects taken, moreover, was almost confined to what could be taught in a laboratory. Reading or teaching for interest, or to learn how physical science was daily extending the power of man, received little attention, because no credit for knowledge thus gained was given in examinations. There was very special need for the reminder that science was not all measurement, nor all measurement science. It is reassuring to see methods that we have pursued for over 30 years with admirable results recommended thus authoritatively. The only sound method of teaching science is to afford a due combination of field or laboratory work, with such literary comments and amplifications as the subject affords. For example, from Ethics of the Dust, children derive a certain enthusiasm for crystals as such that their own unaided observation would be slow to afford. As a matter of fact, the teaching of science in our schools has lost much of the educative value through a fatal and quite unnecessary divorce between science and the humanities. The nature notebooks which originated in the PUS have recommended themselves pretty widely as traveling companions and life records, wherein the finds of every season, bird or flower, fungus or moss, is sketched and described somewhat in the manner of Gilbert White. The Nature Notebook is very Catholic and finds room for the stars in their courses and for, say, the fossil anemone found on the beach at Whitby. Certainly, these notebooks do a good deal to bring science within the range of common thought and experience. We are anxious not to make science a utilitarian subject. Geography The teaching of geography suffers especially from the utilitarian spirit. The whole tendency of modern geography as taught in our schools is to strip the unfortunate planet which has been assigned to us as our abode and environment of every trace of mystery and beauty. There is no longer anything to admire or to wonder at in this sweet world of ours. We can no longer say with Jasper Petalingro, sun, moon, and stars are sweet things, brother, there is likewise the wind on the heath. No, the questions which geography has to solve henceforth are confined to how and under what conditions is the earth's surface profitable to a man and desirable for his habitation. No more may children conceive themselves climbing Mount Blanc or Mount Everest, skating on the fjords of Norway, or swimming in a gondola at Venice. These are not the things that matter, but only how and where and why is money to be made under local conditions on the earth's surface. It is doubtful whether this kind of teaching is even lucrative, because the mind works on great ideas, and upon these works to great ends. Where science does not teach a child to wonder and admire, it has perhaps no educative value. Perhaps no knowledge is more delightful than such an intimacy with the earth's surface, region by region, as should enable the map of any region to unfold a panorama of delight, disclosing not only mountains, rivers, frontiers, the great features we know as geography, but associations, occupations, as parts of the past and much of the present, of every part of this beautiful earth. 
great attention is paid to map work. That is, before reading a lesson, children have found the places mentioned in that lesson on a map and know where they are relatively to other places, to given parallels, meridians. Then, bearing in mind that children do not generalize but must learn by particulars, they read and picture to themselves the Yorkshire Dales, the Sussex Downs, the mysteries of a coal mine. They see pigs of iron flowing forth from the furnace, the slow accretions which have made up the chalk, the stirring life of the great towns and the occupations of the villages. Form 2, A and B, are engaged with the counties of England, county by county, for so diverse are the counties in aspect, history, and occupations that only so can children acquire such a knowledge of England as will prove a key to the geography of every part of the world, whether in the way of comparison or contrast. For instance, while I write, the children in 2A are studying the counties which contain the Thames Basin and write verses on the Thames is part of their term's work. Our sea power by H.W. Household is of extraordinary value in linking England with the world by means of a spirited account of the glorious history of our navy, while the late Sir George Parkin, than whom there is no better qualified authority, carries children round the empire. They are thrown on their own resources or those of their teachers for what may be called current geography. For instance, learn what you can about the political map of Europe after the Great War. Evans. In Form 3, the geography is still regional, that is, children are led to form an intimate acquaintance with the countries of Europe, so that the map of any country calls up in a child's imagination a wonderful panorama of the diversities of the country, of the people, their history, and occupations. It is evident that this kind of geographical image cannot be secured in any other way than by considering Europe country by country. They begin with a general survey of the seas and shores of the continent, of the countries and the peoples, of the diversities of tongues and their historical origin, of the plains and mountains, of the rivers and their basins. A survey after which they should be able to answer such questions as, Name three rivers which flow into the Baltic. What lands form the southern and eastern shores of the Mediterranean? What countries are washed by the Baltic? Between what parallels does Europe extend? What other continents lie partly within the same parallels? The young scholars are at home with the map of Europe before they consider the countries separately. The pictures we present of the several countries is meant to be before all things interesting and at the same time to provide an intelligent and fairly exhaustive account of the given country. Whatever further knowledge a child acquires will fit into this original scheme. For example, the Rhone Valley and the border lands. The warm and fertile Rhone Valley belongs in climate to the southern region, where, although the vine is grown, large plantations of olive and mulberry occupy much of the land. We are apt to think of the south of France as the sunny south, the sweet south, but, says a writer whom we have already quoted, it is austere, grim, somber. But the mulberry feeds the silkworm and so furnishes material for the great manufacture of France. Lyons, the second city of France, is the seat of the silk manufacture, including those of velvets and satins. It is seated upon a tongue of land at the confluence of the rapid Rhone and the sluggish Saone, and along the banks of both rivers are fine quays. This extract indicates how geographical facts are introduced incidentally, pretty much as a traveler comes across them. The work for one term includes Belgium, Holland, Spain, and Portugal, and the interests connected with each of these countries are manifold. For example, on the seashore near Leyden is Catwick, where the expiring Rhine is helped to discharge itself into the sea by means of a wide artificial channel provided with no less than 13 pairs of enormous floodgates. These are shut to keep out the sea when the tide is coming in and open to let the streams pass out during ebb tide. Notwithstanding these great works, the once glorious Rhine makes but an ignoble exit. The delta of this river may be said to include the whole breadth of Holland. 
It will be noticed that an attempt is made to show the romance of the natural features, the history, the industries, so that a country is no more a mere matter of names on a map or of sections shown by contour lines. Such generalizations are not geography, but are slow conclusions which the mind should come to of itself when it acquires intimacy with a region. Something of a literary character is preserved in the geography lessons. The new feature in these is the study of maps, which should be very thorough. For the rest, the single reading and narration as described in connection with other work is sufficient in this subject also. Children cannot tell what they have not seen with the mind's eye, which we know as imagination, and they cannot see what is not told in their books with some vividness and some grasp of the subject. The thoroughness of the map study is shown by such a question to be answered from memory as, What part of Belgium does the Scheldt drain? Name any of its feeders. Name ten famous places in its basin. What port stands at the head of its estuary? We find great light thrown upon the geography of the empire in a little book of literary quality, fighting for sea power in the days of sail. There are two rational ways of teaching geography. The first is the inferential method, a good deal in vogue at the present time. By it, the pupil learns certain geographical principles which he is expected to apply universally. This method seems to me defective for two reasons. It is apt to be misleading, as in every particular case the general principle is open to modifications. Also, local color and personal and historical interests are wanting, and the scholar does not form an intellectual and imaginative conception of the region he is learning about. The second, which might be called the panoramic method, unrolls the landscape of the world, region by region, before the eyes of the scholar, within every region its own conditions of climate, its productions, its people, their industries, and their history. This way of teaching the most delightful of all subjects has the effect of giving to a map of a country or region the brilliancy of color and the wealth of detail which a panorama might afford, together with a sense of proportion and a knowledge of general principles. I believe that pictures are not of very great use in this study. We all know that the pictures which abide with us are those which the imagination constructs from written descriptions. The geography for Form 4 includes Asia, Africa, America, and Australasia. But the same principle is followed. Vivid descriptions, geographical principles, historical associations, and industrial details are afforded which should make, as we say, an impression, should secure that the region traversed becomes an imaginative possession as well as affording data for reasonable judgments. The pupil begins with a survey of Asia, followed by a separate treatment of the great countries and divisions and of the great physical features. Thus of Siberia we read, All travelers unite in praise of the free Siberian peasant. As soon as one crosses the Urals, one is surprised by the extreme friendliness and good nature of the inhabitants, as much as by the rich vegetation of the well-cultivated fields and the excellent state of the roads in the southern part of the government of Tobolsk. Or, the glossy jet-black, soft, thick fur of the sea otter is the most valuable of all the Russian skins. Next ranks the skin of the black fox. But though a thousand of its skins are worth no more than one skin of the sea otter, the little gray squirrel whose skins are imported by the million really plays the most important part in the Siberian fur trade. Of Further India Pegu, the middle division, is really the vast delta of the Irrawaddy, a low-lying country which yields enormous quantities of rice, while on the higher grounds, which wall in the great river, are the finest teak forests in the world. Africa follows Asia with the discoveries of Livingstone, Speke, Burton, Grant, etc. We get an account of African village life, and among the chapter headings are Abyssinia, Egypt, Up the Nile, the Sudan, the Sahara, the Barbary States, South Africa, Cape Colony, the Islands. America follows with an account of the progress of discovery, a geographical sketch of South America, the Andes and the Mountain States, Chile, Peru, Bolivia, etc. 
the Great Plains of South America, Central America, North America, Canada, a historical sketch of the United States, the Eastern States, States of the Mississippi Valley, the Prairies, the Western States and Territories, California. In the section on the Eastern States we read, Stretching from this chain, the Alleghenies, is the great Appalachian coal field which extends through Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Ohio, with a length of 720 miles containing, it is said, coal enough to supply the world for 4,000 years. Iron occurs with the coal in great abundance. Most of this coal is of the kind called anthracite. It is extremely slow in burning, emits no smoke, but has a painfully drying effect upon the air of a room. Sir Charles Lyall, speaking of Pottsville on this coal field, says, Here I was agreeably surprised to see a flourishing manufacturing town with the tall chimneys of a hundred furnaces burning night and day, yet quite free from smoke. Leaving this clear atmosphere and going down into one of the mines, it was a no less pleasing novelty to find that we could handle the coal without soiling our fingers. But enough has been said to indicate the sort of intimacy that scholars in Form 4 get with all quarters of the world. Their geography, landscape, histories, and industries, together with the study of the causes which affect climate and industries. Geike's physical geography affords an admirable introduction to the principles of physical geography. Forms 5 and 6 are expected to keep up with the newspapers and know something about places and regions coming most into note in the current term. Also, in connection with the history studied, Seeley's Expansion of England, The Peoples and Problems of India, Geike's Elementary Lessons in Physical Geography, Mort's Practical Geography, and Kipling's Letters of Travel are included in the reading of one term. In these forms, the young students are expected to apply their knowledge to geography, both practical and theoretical, and to make much use of a good atlas without the map questions which have guided the map work of the lower forms. Section 3b, The Knowledge of the Universe, Mathematics. The question of arithmetic and of mathematics generally is one of great import to us as educators. So long as the idea of faculties obtained, no doubt we were right to put all possible weight on a subject so well adapted to train the reasoning powers. But now we are assured that these powers do not wait upon our training. They are there in any case, and if we keep a chief place in our curriculum for arithmetic, we must justify ourselves upon other grounds. We take strong ground when we appeal to the beauty and truth of mathematics. That is, as Ruskin points out, two and two make four, and cannot conceivably make five, is an inevitable law. It is a great thing to be brought into the presence of a law, of a whole system of laws that exist without our concurrence. That two straight lines cannot enclose a space is a fact which we can perceive, state, and act upon, but cannot in any wise alter, should give to children the sense of limitation which is wholesome for all of us, and inspire that sursum corda which we should hear in all natural law. Again, integrity in our dealings depends largely upon Mr. Micawber's golden rule, while Harold Skimple's disregard of these things is a moral offense against society. Once again, we do not live on gymnastics. The mind, like the body, is invigorated by regular spells of hard exercise. But education should be a science of proportion, and any one subject that assumes undue importance does so at the expense of other subjects which a child's mind should deal with. Arithmetic, mathematics are exceedingly easy to examine upon, and so long as education is regulated by examinations, so long shall we have teaching directed not to awaken a sense of awe in contemplating a self-existing science, but rather to secure exactness and ingenuity in the treatment of problems. What is better, it will be said, than a training in exactness and ingenuity? But in saying so, we assume that this exactness and ingenuity brought about in arithmetic serve us in every department of life. Were this the case, we should indeed have a royal road to learning. But it would seem that no such road is open to us. 
the habits and powers brought to bear upon any one educational subject are exercised upon that subject simply. The familiar story of how Sir Isaac Newton, teased by his cat's cries to be let in, caused a large hole in the door to be made for the cat, and a small one for the kitten, illustrates not a mere amusing lapse in a great mind, but the fact that work upon special lines qualifies for work upon those lines only. One hears of more or less deficient boys to whom the study of a Bradshaw is a delight, of an admirable accountant who was otherwise a little deficient. The boy who gets full marks in arithmetic makes a poor show in history, because the accuracy and ingenuity brought out by his sums apply to his sums only. And as for the value of arithmetic in practical life, most of us have private reasons for agreeing with the eminent staff officer who tells us that, I have never found any mathematics except simple addition of the slightest use in a workaday life, except in the staff college examinations, and as for mental gymnastics and accuracy of statement, I dispute the contention that mathematics supply either any better than any other study. We have, most of us, believed that a knowledge of the theory and practice of war depended a good deal upon mathematics, so this statement by a distinguished soldier is worth considering. In a word, our point is that mathematics are to be studied for their own sake, and not as they make for general intelligence and grasp of mind. But then how profoundly worthy are these subjects of study for their own sake, to say nothing of other great branches of knowledge to which they are ancillary. Lack of proportion should be our bete noire in drawing up a curriculum, remembering that the mathematician who knows little of the history of his own country or that of any other is sparsely educated at best. At the same time, genius has her own rights. The born mathematician must be allowed full scope even to the omission of much else that he should know. He soon asserts himself, sees into the intricacies of a problem with half an eye, and should have scope. He would prefer not to have much teaching. But why should the tortoise keep pace with the hare, and why should a boy's success in life depend upon the drudgery and mathematics? That is the tendency at the present moment, to close the universities and consequently the professions to boys and girls who, because they have little natural aptitude for mathematics, must acquire a mechanical knowledge by such heavy, all-engrossing labor as must needs shut out such knowledge of the humanities, say, as is implied in the phrase, a liberal education. The claims of the London matriculation examination, for example, are acknowledged by many teachers to be incompatible with the wide knowledge proper to an educated person. Mathematics depend upon the teacher rather than upon the textbook, and few subjects are worse taught, chiefly because teachers have seldom time to give the inspiring ideas, what Coleridge calls the captain ideas, which should quicken imagination. How living would geometry become in the light of the discoveries of Euclid as he made them? To sum up, mathematics are a necessary part of every man's education. They must be taught by those who know, but they may not engross the time and attention of the scholar in such wise as to shut out any of the score of subjects, a knowledge of which is his natural right. It is unnecessary to exhibit mathematical work done in the PUS as it is on the same lines and reaches the same standard as in other schools. No doubt his habit of entire attention favors the PUS scholar. Section 3C. The Knowledge of the Universe, Physical Development, Handicrafts. It is unnecessary, too, to say anything about games, dancing, physical exercises, needlework, and other handicrafts, as the methods employed in these are not exceptional. I hope you enjoyed this chapter of Charlotte Mason's Volume 6, and of course, if you need help, there's always the annotated edition, or you can come find us and ask questions. We'd love to help you. You can find us at cmplenary.com or over in our Facebook group. Look forward to chatting with you. 